Hello, everyone. This is Live Life Well TV host Robert Landau, and this is another episode of America's Greatest Personalities. This episode, it is my pleasure to bring to you information about the one, the only, Ms. Sarah Vaughn. Stay tuned. Sarah Vaughn has often been referred to as the greatest living singer in the world. Yet, at the same time, she was often overshadowed by um, other wonderful singers. Let's use an example, one of them by the name of Ella Fitzgerald. Ms. Vaughn was also a collection of a number of paradoxes. She loved to party by night, and so by day. She was impulsive about men and yet tended to allegedly lure lovers who could double as managers. She smoked chronically, yet she sang masterfully until her passing at the age of 66 in 1990. Her daughter Deborah once said this, I am not sure anyone knew this woman. Hmm. So let's try to um, clear some of that up uh, with the following information about the great life of the great Sarah Vaughn. She once said, when I sing, trouble can sit right on my shoulder and I don't even notice. She also said, there are notes between notes, you know, Sarah Vaughn also said, there is a category for me. I like to be referred to as a good song singer of good songs in good taste. Sarah also said, my dream is to do whatever I want without any interference from my record company. But my favorite quote of hers is this one, when she once said, I dig Doris Day. <laughs> she was called, you might remember, sassy. She was also called the divine one. And if you ask me, all for good reason. Sarah's father was a carpenter and an amateur guitarist. Sarah's mother was a laundress. Sarah, their only natural child, um, their, her parents would adopt another female later, uh, but Sarah was born in Newark, New Jersey. The year was 1924. The date was March 27th. Her folks were extremely religious and happened to have been very active in the local Baptist church. It would be there that young Sarah would sing in the church choir, and not only that, but she would play the piano as well. At a very early age, Sarah knew what her first love was, music. And to that end, she would often illegally sneak into nightclubs in Newark to play the piano and sometimes even sing. Sarah's father was just a little concerned that his only daughter was developing a keen interest in the popular music of the day. I'm sure that he wished she would have solely stuck with the religious-based music featured in their church. But think of how Sarah must have felt. You are so passionately in love with something, and in her case, it happened to have been music, that you would do anything to constantly have it be a continuous part of your life. Well, that was Sarah. She was obsessed. And what happens to your schooling when you get so obsessed with something like music and going to hear it and maybe be a part of it in clubs, you drop out of high school to pursue music more fully. And of course, as you can probably well imagine, that's exactly what happened in Sarah's case. So much so that Newark wouldn't be enough to satisfy Sarah's deep craving to be a actor 
active part of the music scene back in those days. Something across the river from Newark was calling her, and it happened to have been big band music. Big band was all the rage back then, and Sarah and her girlfriends would often cross the Hudson River and venture into Harlem to hear big bands play at Harlem's ballroom and the one and only Apollo Theater. It would be at one of those two Harlem venues that Sarah would start her incredible career in 1942. When Sarah was all of 18 years of age, she would win first prize in a talent show at the Apollo Theater. That talent show would yield a lot of the popular names that we still know to this day. What would be her first prize winnings exactly? Ten dollars. But also, even more important, the promise of a week-long engagement at the one and only Apollo Theater. So, in the spring of 1943, Sarah found herself back at the Apollo Theater, and she didn't have to compete with anyone during her run there. All she had to do, get this, was to be the opening act for someone by the name of Ella Fitzgerald. During that week of what was probably incredible shows, I mean, think of seeing just that show alone, Sarah Vaughn would be introduced to a pianist by the name of Earl Hines. You might have heard of him. And what exactly do you think would happen from there? Hines would offer Vaughn a female singer spot in his fledgling band. Would Sarah accept? You better believe she did. For the remainder of 1943 and all through 1944, Sarah would tour the country with Earl Father Hines and his big band. Earl Hines and his band are credited for many wonderful things, but one of them happens to be the advent of something that you might have heard called bebop. Not only that, but listen to who Hines just happened to have had in his band at that very point in time. Someone by the name of Dizzy Gillespie, someone else by the name of Charlie Bird Parker, and a baritone big band singer that you might have heard of by the name of Billy Eckstein. When Mr. Eckstein left to form his own band, Sarah would go with him, and it was at this time that her very first recording would be released. The date was December 5th, 1944, and the song was called I'll Wait and Pray. Of course, more recordings would follow. Sarah left the Eckstein band in 1945 to pursue a solo career, and to that end, she would appear in numerous nightclubs in and around the New York City area. In 1945, Vaughn would release a tune that I am quite sure many of you know, a tune often associated with the great Billy Holiday by the name of Lover Man, Oh Where Can You Be? It was a smash hit. Sarah's career was truly getting underway at this particular point in time. More recordings would follow as well as numerous nightclub appearances such as the famed Cafe Society in Lower Manhattan. It was at this point in time that Sarah would meet a trumpeter by the name of George Treadwell. He became her confidant and, as I alluded to before, her manager. Not only that, but he also happened to produce and arrange. He became her husband on September 16th, 1946, Sarah recorded and performed a number of hits at this point in time. Some of them you might know, such as If You Could See Me Now, Don't Blame Me, I've Got a Crush on You, Everything I Have is Yours, remember this one, Tenderly. Also, 
It's magic and body and soul, just to name a few. Appearances with symphony orchestras and very successful tours of Europe were now occurring on a more frequent basis. Her marriage with George Treadwell unfortunately soured, as did her relationships with just a little outfit called Columbia records. Columbia forced her into nothing but commercial recordings and Sarah really wanted to do her own thing when it came to the fine art of making records. Even though Vaughn's personal relationship with Treadwell wasn't on the up and up, he still made sure that her career was. He would end up negotiating a very lucrative contract with Mercury, records. And here is where Sarah could do more of her own thing. And of course, more hits would follow. Hits such as Misty. Remember Misty? Incredible tune. Even though Sarah's career was in full swing at this time, she decided to divorce Treadwell in 1958. She toured, she recorded, she won numerous awards, and even with all that, you know what was left to split with Treadwell in the divorce? Not much, all of $16,000 after all those appearances, all those recordings, all those awards. It's not a very large sum when you think about it. Treadwell had managed Vaughn's financial matters throughout all of those years. The couple's business relationship was also terminated at that point in time. Sarah had already met another man by the name of Clyde C.B. Atkins and married him. Atkins also became her professional manager as the two decided to buy a house in New Jersey. Since Sarah couldn't have kids, the couple adopted a baby girl whose quote I shared with you at the beginning of this presentation. Her name is Deborah Lois. So when her relationship with Clyde C.B. Atkins would unfortunately turn violent, Sarah wisely decided that she had had enough. It was over, but not without a major issue finances. Atkins was a compulsive gambler and had gambled away most of Sarah's immense fortune. So much so that at the time of their divorce, Vaughn found that she was no less than $150,000 in debt. Their house in New Jersey was immediately seized by the IRS. Sarah got custody of their child and found another man to be involved with to manage her career. They would be together for no less than 10 years. During these 10 years that they were together, so many things were changing in the music industry. This happened to have been the 60s and people wanted to hear much less of jazz and much more of rock and roll. Sarah terminated her personal and professional relationship with her current beau and decided to move to California, Hidden Hills, to be specific near Benedict Canyon, right outside of LA. Sarah would meet a guy by the name of Marshall Fisher after a 1970 performance at a Las Vegas casino, and guess what happened? They married, but also guess what happened? He became her manager. More recordings, more concert dates, presidential command performances and television appearances would follow. And Sarah would meet another trumpet player, 16 years her junior, and guess what? Well, wait a minute. She never officially married the last one, uh, but she did end up officially marrying this one. And this would be her third marriage. The year was 1978. More recordings, tours, and other major performing dates later. The couple would unfortunately divorce in 1981. All through the 1980s, Vaughn would continue to perform with great acclaim. Maybe you've seen her on television 
television, on The Tonight Show, on uh, variety shows. Any performance that she would undertake, if you ask me, was brilliant. Nobody could sing a tune like the great Sarah Vaughn. And now she would finally be officially recognized for her incredible achievements in American music. She was now free to do whatever she wanted. And if that meant appearing with more symphony orchestras nationwide, doing, let's say, an all Gershwin concert, well then, so be it. Audiences couldn't get enough of the great Sarah Vaughan. If also that meant her appearing by her choice in a studio recording of South Pacific with major opera singers, and she would be singing uh, the role of Bloody Mary and singing songs such as Bally High, which I think was perfect for her, then so be it. Sarah Vaughn had won the hearts and respect of the music-loving public, but unfortunately, this wonderful ride was not to last. In 1989, Sarah's health was in decline, although you would have never known it by seeing her. It was also during that year that Vaughn found out that she had lung cancer. She fought bravely at first, but as time went on, she was just too tired to continue to fight. On the evening of April 3rd, 1990, the great Sarah Vaughn passed on watching her daughter in a made-for-TV movie at Sarah's home in California. The great Sarah Vaughn, as I said at the beginning of this presentation, was only 66 years of age. What can be said about her amazing 45 year career? I mean, she recorded every jazz song there ever was and more. But it's important to note that Sarah didn't want to be known as a jazz singer. And here in her own words is why. I don't know why people call me a jazz singer, though I guess people associate me with jazz because I was raised in it from way back. I'm not putting jazz down, but I am not a jazz singer. I've even been called a blues singer. I've recorded all kinds of music, but to them, I'm either a jazz singer or a blues singer. You know what? I can't sing a blues, just a write out blues, but I can put the blues in whatever I sing. I might sing Send in the Clowns, and I might stick a little bluesy part into it or any song. What I want to do music wise is all kinds of music that I like, and I like all kinds of music. Sarah's singing style had everything to do with the instrument she would find herself performing with. She said, I always wanted to imitate the horns. Scat singing, which Ella Fitzgerald and Louis Armstrong made famous. Um, she was also what many musicologists believed to be the first great singer of the modern era of jazz. She had impeccable pitch and impeccable timing. Uh, and she had one of the most amazing vocal ranges of any singer ever. She could do anything from rock and roll to bebop to Brazilian sambas. She made an album of Brazilian sambas that I used to have that I think I wore out actually. She could sing gospel. She could sing the saddest, most gut wrenching ballad around as well. She recorded more than 50 incredible albums during her momentous career. She could also be kind of difficult to work with, but that was because she knew what she wanted and refused to settle for anything less. She loved to party and would often do so after a gig into the early and sometimes late hours of the morning. A jazz critic once said that Sarah Vaughn had one of the most wondrous voices of the 20th century. See how this keeps repeating herself? Thank God she was recognized for the incredible talent she was. And that's 
kind of where I would like to leave things. I have immense admiration and appreciation for great American personalities that from a very early age know what they are here to do. And by God, they just set to the task of getting it done their way and nobody else's. This has been Robert Landau. Thank you so much for joining me for this edition of America's Greatest Personalities that featured the great Sarah Vaughn. I will see you on another episode of this series here on Live Life Well TV.